delight and pleasure to welcome this morning uh, Rex Lee. Rex is the CIO of one of Canada's truly iconic organizations, Canadian Tire. Um, it's, it's, of course, a, a, a iconic Canadian retail business. And we all know the amount of disruption and opportunities that uh, technology presents to retailers. I'm extremely excited to hear from Rex um, you know, th on things that he's working on. So Rex, thank you very much for your time. Welcome to our program. Um, I often start by asking you know, my guests to, to tell us their story, how you navigated your life, how you navigated your career to now be at the helm of technology at Canadian Tire. Great, thank you, uh, Dalvor, and thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to be a part of uh, this series. I've listened to uh, some of these uh, other speakers and it's been a phenomenal um, number of uh, individuals and it's great to see the talent we have uh, across this country of ours. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to tell you that I had some beautiful master plan <laughs> that was extremely well executed and, and that's how I became in the role I'm, I'm in. I would be, of course, uh, completely lying <laughs> if I told you that. Uh, the truth is, I um, I struggled a lot in uh, mm. in high school, um, and I really had no clue what I wanted to do. I um, I wasted a lot of time playing video games, um, but you know, through that uh, passion, I I started to get interested in understanding how these video games were actually built and. I started to teach myself um, how to code. Although back in those days, it wasn't as sexy as coding is today. We called it programming. And um, I started with basic beginners, all purpose symbolic instruction code and uh, taught, taught myself assembler and um, you know got into, into some, some of the coding stuff and, and just did it as a, uh, for fun, I'm very much a, a real geek in uh, you know sort of playing with with technology it didn't help me with my uh, studies at school uh, very much um, but you know it, it was something I was quite passionate about I even um, I even built a uh, almost like a software as a service although there was no cloud back then uh, capability uh, for a restaurant that I was working uh, at and I built a time tracking uh, system for them where they would give me a bunch of data and then I would I, brought, I built the program and I would input that data and it would schedule people and I would send it back to them and uh, I, I probably didn't make a lot of money but at the time I thought it was a lot of money it was a nice side hustle again side hustles weren't a thing back then either um so and, a true pioneer in every sense <laughs> uh, you know hey I it was um it, it was just fun stuff to do and I had no real aspirations and I went into university and um, I went to the University of Western Ontario uh, and I took a, a BA or got a BA in administrative and commercial studies. And it was fascinating for me. I got to learn a lot about organizational behavior and leadership and information and management and uh, lots of the various theories. And, and funny enough, I still apply a lot of what I've learned, you know, um, although at the time I thought, well, this is not going to lead into anything. And when I graduated from university still not really knowing what I wanted to do. So uh, like many other people, I said, I might as well just go back to school. And mm -hmm. I did. And so I did my um, my MBA mm -hmm. at uh, Schulich, oh, sorry, at, not Schulich, at McMaster, DeGroote. Um, and, um, you know, I, it, when I did my MBA, I thought, okay, well, you know, I, I'll probably get into marketing. It, it, it sort of was something that sort of attracted me, but I, I still just, did this technology thing and it was always kind of this this thing and then when i graduated i um you know went through a whole bunch of interviews and the interviews that i got tended to be more technology flavored roles and even though i was kind of applying to sort of more marketing kind of roles because that's where i thought i wanted to go um and i uh, i landed my first job um at bell canada in mm -hmm. it and um, I, uh, I remember going, well, you know, maybe the universe is trying to tell me something here. Uh, maybe this tech thing is, is more than just a hobby. And um, 
I still re I still recall the interviewer asking me, uh, how long do you, you plan on staying with Bell Canada? And I honestly said, maybe two years. And I thought, yeah, two years is about enough time for me to understand everything about Bell Canada and, uh, you know, move on to my next job. I stayed there for 11 years. Wow. And I had such great opportunity to learn from so many different uh, fan leaders and technologies and uh, Bell is so big that I can move around and do so many different things. Um, and in my time at Bell, I, uh, I also broke a lot of rules mm. and um, some of those, those broken rules helped me in terms of my career and, and um, you know, where I eventually landed. I remember when I first started being the new guy, they put me in an aisle where all the old PCs went to die. So it was a big, you know, junk collection of old PCs. And um, just working late, I thought it would be fun to disassemble those PCs and build a server, which I did. And I actually hooked it up into the network, um, all of which I was not supposed to do. Yep. And I got uh, <laughs> noticed both good and bad, uh, but I, I created a way for the IT departments uh, to actually share information and files that they weren't able to do easily. Uh, at that time, email wasn't even you know dominant uh, yet and they had various forms of communication. And, and so um, it, it did get me noticed. Uh, and so it, it allowed me to then progress from there and do a whole bunch of other things. And um, it, it was fabulous. The, the one, one other rule that we broke and I got in trouble with that actually helped propel my career and funny enough uh was this this social um collaboration technology that we built at skunk works mm -hmm. and it's an interesting story in that i was uh intrigued by this brand new television show called american idol mm -hmm. and um what intrigued me wasn't so much the entertainment and the music and the singing all that you know that was that was interesting what really intrigued me was the business model um, because the way I thought about it was here's a bunch of people looking to sell a product, wanting to maximize their return uh, on commercializing a product. The product just happens to be a singer in this situation. And so what product do you sell? Well, if you ask people what they want to buy, maybe you sell them what they've told you. And uh, sure enough, that's exactly what the model was. And so um, I thought it was fascinating how people would pay to select uh, their favorite singer. And then at the end of it, they would commercialize that singer and sell it back to people and they would pay even more to yep. buy their albums and go to their, and I thought, wow, this is brilliant. And I started to think a little bit about, could you apply that logic to ideas in a corporate setting? Could you open it up to the masses and say, Hey, there's lots of these ideas. Which one of these ideas are the best? And based on what people said, could you then implement it and get the greatest value in return on that? And I shared that with my CIO at Bell Canada at the time. And uh, he thought, wow, this is a really cool idea. Let's, let's go do something. And he gave me some money uh, and um, we did some skunk works. And for the first while, things were great. Lots of great ideas. People were participating and doing all this good stuff. And then something bad happened. Um, well, there was a change in policy at Bell Canada in regards to, uh, uh, well, uh, compensation, uh, and we'll get into the details of it, but it did have a bit of a backlash mm. and because we created a forum that was open to everybody, it was used as a way for people to, um, tell management what they thought <laughs> of uh, the changes. And it became, uh, we created our own denial of service. Again, didn't even know what denial of service was back then, um, but we created our own problems. We actually, things got shut down because just the volume of activity that would happen on the server. And because this was never really sanctioned, it was all skunk works. I got hauled in front of the, uh, the CEO with uh, other executives um to say well who authorized this who allowed this to happen and all those kind of things and i thought for sure i was going to get fired funny enough not the first time i thought i was going to get fired uh, <laughs> but um i thought i was going to get fired but the uh, cio at at the time eugene roman um he actually and i'll never forget this he actually stood up to uh the entire executive team there and it was it was pretty you know big boardroom and you know 
and said, if you want to fire somebody, fire me. And he did that, you know, gave me air cover on um, wow. what we were doing because, you know, and I was just blown away that somebody would, would do that. And, and, um, and he, he did. Um, that then progressed into a whole bunch of sanctioned things that we actually built at Canadian Tire and it became uh, quite powerful. And uh, it was something that we actually started to sell to other customers. And one of those customers happened to be uh, RIM, Research oh, yeah. in Motion, yep. Yep. and BlackBerry. And I remember they, they would bring me out there to sort of talk about um, the stuff that you're doing with social computing and how does this work? And, um, you know, so I, I would sit there and I'd tell them what the, the, you would do. And then I got a phone call um, after one of the presentations by uh, someone there and they said, hey, I actually read about this stuff. It was it was published in a, in a book um, and uh, they, they, uh, they had read through it and said, we just want you to build all of that stuff here. Just could you just do that? And what was fascinating about RIM in those days was it was completely unconstrained. There was, you know, what they promised was whatever money you need, whoever you want to hire, anywhere from around the world, build it from scratch, ground up. And, and how many opportunities do you get, you know, when someone says that to you? Right? Very few. Uh, even, even such, I debated for a long time because uh, I really liked the you know, being at Bell and, and um, you know, I could get stuff done and it was fantastic people and I was afraid. Looking back, it was an obvious good move to make, uh, but at the time it, it wasn't obvious. Um, my time at, at BlackBerry was fantastic, loved it. I still love my Blackberries. I still miss the, uh, the physical keyboard. Um, and I didn't have any interest in, in leaving until I got the call from that same CIO that gave me air cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had moved on to Canadian Tire, Mm -hmm. And he called me and said, hey, listen, I, um, I have to do a whole bunch of stuff and I need some help. Are you interested in retail? No, I don't know. Um, and then he explained to me what they needed to do, uh, the technology transformation that was required. Yeah. Um, and it sounded a little more interesting. He was pretty convincing. And so I, uh, I picked up a role at Canadian Tire starting off with digital transformation and, and building out an e-commerce capability and then progress to do a variety of different things and uh, eventually um, you know led me to the uh, the position that I'm now uh, getting the opportunity to to lead a fantastic team uh, unbelievable uh, organization and just fabulous people um, and doing some some amazing things and so a lot of luck a lot of circumstances uh, a lot of breaking rules and, and getting in yeah. trouble and somehow navigating through that um and a lot of uh people that have helped bring me through um yeah. and it's kind of how I, I landed to the role i'm in what a fantastic story you say, you say <laughs> luck yeah I th well i think luck happens to follow people who have you know, who have courage to make bold moves you are clearly a, a you know a, the epitome of a pioneer and innovator. <laughs> this is this is really cool. Very, very cool. Thank you for sharing that with us, Rex. So now, of course, uh, at, at Canadian Tire, you, you, you are leading the technology and digital portfolio. Are you able to mm -hmm. share with us sort of what, what are the cool things that you are working on, but also what are those challenges you're facing and you know, what, what, mm -hmm. what, what are the obstacles in front that you see? Yeah, it's um... I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big question. I, I was doing an interview, uh, recently and at the end of the interviews, I often ask people, um, do they have any questions for me? And, uh, this person said to me, their, their question was, I'd, I'd like to understand why you're at Canadian tire. Mm. Oh, that was a good question. And, um, you know, I explained to them, uh, we have a big investor day coming up tomorrow where we're going to share our strategy. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, so I, I won't steal it slender. Um, but I will say that at the core of it is this idea about we are here to make life in Canada better. And I believe we can say that with authenticity because we're truly a Canadian organization and that's how this company grew up. Like it was never a formulaic company of, you know, you just sell this, do this. The, the history of Canadian Tire is fascinating in that it's always been purposeful around the customer, about Canadians. And um, the eclectic assortment of products that we have is a testament to being very, very much customer focused. It was, I often say, the original everything store in that mm. we're not constrained by, you know, 
um, product, um, as long as we focus on customer and whatever the customer needs, whatever Canadians need and, and their needs continue to change and it's different uh, coast to coast, um, we'll be successful and we have been. And so there's not too many Canadian uh, retail organizations, actually Canadian organizations as a whole, which are fully Canadian. And I don't have to convince head office that uh, you know, can is a little bit different uh, than what the corporate strategy is and how we need to you know focus on this and focus at, because that is us. And so, having that opportunity is is pretty exciting, and it it allows us to differentiate. We're celebrating our hundredth anniversary. The store in my uh, background here is is uh, the first Toronto store that that um, that we had. Um, and you know, to survive a hundred years requires a lot of a lot of things um, requires that focus and allow it requires your ability to be innovative and, and to adapt. Um, and so in terms of what we're doing and where we're going to survive for the next hundred years, um, there's a ton of work um, that that we need to do um, to think about uh, the competitive landscape yep. um, and the evolving needs and demands of, of customers and the disruption that is uh, constantly happening across the organization. And so there are um, core things that we'll focus on about how do we make life in Canada better? Um, how do we provide the services? How do we ensure that the technology is there um, for those, uh, those things? And then in sort of core technology, um, there's a, a big modernization effort uh, that we're doing as well. And I, I break it down into four four segments, if you will. Mm -hmm. yep. And although there's a logical sequence to these segments, um, they're all running in parallel and there's a lot of iteration that happens. The first one is this idea of how do you uh, scale um, your processes for longer term visions and uh, objectives and standardize across the enterprise so that you can reuse quickly. And sometimes people when they talk about agile, think of it as a uh, free form, do whatever you want, uh, kind of, which is, it is not. Um, but if you can harness um, standard enterprise processes with the thinking of long term, 5, 10, 15, 20 years out, what do you need to do? You can actually go a lot faster with upfront investment. And so that work across the many banners that we have and, and the breadth of what we do is, is a big component of what needs to happen at Canadian Tire. The second component we talk to um, architecture, uh, technology, but, but architecture and how you think about these things for scale. One of the challenges uh, that we've had in the past at Canadian Tire, and I've seen this elsewhere as well, is too much focus on projects, one-off initiatives, things that people need to get done. And when you focus on projects, you're not necessarily stitching together all those projects with a long-term view of mm -hmm. what needs to get done. And so you make decisions that uh, compromise on, on long-term value. Um, you know, for example, uh, we've all been taught uh, about scope, time, budget, quality, yep. you know, the triple constraints, PMBOK, and all those kind of good things. The problem with just focusing on that is that you can deliver all those things and still deliver no value to the customer. Correct. And, um, you know, part of what's happened over time is this, it creates a, an us versus them mentality um, between your business partners and technology. And you get this sort of ridiculous spin on, um, we got no business value and, and the technology guys say, not my fault. Uh, I delivered what you asked for. Uh, and the business folks are like, why didn't you tell us that this wasn't going to deliver it? And, and it just goes in circles and, and it, it's not, it's not going to lead to long-term success. So when you think of architecture and you're thinking scale and security and stability, and resiliency and supportability and all these sort of core architectural principles, and you have a roadmap and you're thinking five, 10, 15, 20 years out, um, it changes your decisions. And so that becomes core. So the obvious ones that uh, people are looking at are enterprise services and APIs and cloud capabilities, elastic computing, you know, these kind of things. Um, and then there's core platforms and, and sort of being able to figure out which are those things that you are going to differentiate 
yourself on as a corporation? And which are the things that are commodity capabilities that you don't really need to differentiate yourself on? Um, and have some really hard discussion um, because if you uh, just look at them as one-offs, everybody wants to be the best at everything, um, but you don't necessarily as a corporation need to be the best at everything. You need to be the best at a few things and you need to buck the trend on, on some. Uh, otherwise you just become like everybody else. So architecture is a, a big component. The third component would be automate the heck out of everything. Um, and so there's multiple reasons why you want to do that. And it's easier, easier said than done. Um, and so a lot of the automation, um, whether it's RPA or intelligent automation, um, or workflow, um, or business process automation, um, people don't know that it can be automated. And yeah. so there's the opportunity to be disruptive and automate. And, and if you do those things, so you figure out your processes, you think about your architecture and, um, you then automate everything you can completely change your operating model, how people work. Um, and so the, um, the opportunity for individuals is that they can now do way more than they ever could with fewer people, um, because of good architecture, strong processes and automation. And that allows you to go faster and obviously be more competitive in that and, and tailor towards that focus on customer and how do we make sure that we're always focused on, on customer. So it's um, a sort of a high level flyby over a sort of a four prong strategy of what we're looking at Canadian Tire. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it supports a longer term vision. I remember uh, Dalvor, um, I was asked once by an executive, what's our, our roadmap on technology? And I remember saying, um, you mean, what's our business roadmap? Because just having a technology roadmap without sort of linking it to a business strategy is not usually a recipe for success. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, now that we're, uh, we've got a pretty solid five year and 10 year kind of view towards where we're going, it allows us to think about technology holistically outside of individual projects, but thinking to a, a greater, uh, more important objective for the organization. So that would be, you know, how I would, I would classify the, uh, the, uh, the, the strategy. I tied in there some of the challenges. We we're a hundred years old. We have a little bit of technical debt yeah. and, um, you know, that technical debt is hard to pay off. I, I sometimes, talk about technical debt, like financial debt. It's not necessarily a bad thing until you can't make the payments mm. and, or you stop making the payments. And that's then a, it becomes that's a, really problematic. That's a, that's a very good way to think about it. Actually. That's, that's a very good yeah. way to think about it. Yeah. 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 I think it's helpful. And, uh, so there, yeah, we have some debt. It's not going to be all paid off. Um, but we need to understand, you know, what are the payments that, that have to be done? Mm. I love what you said about uh, about this focus on projects and the fact that mm. the project can be delivered on time, on scope, on budget, yeah, and still be viewed as failure because there is no yeah. value conversation. So, uh, yeah. like we are, we are you know, very much <laughs> in those conversations these days with our clients as well. Like it's not about what we deliver; it's about what value is ultimately generated from that that is delivered. So that that's actually very good. Really? Um, so, so Rex, obviously, you just told us your story, and it's 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 a rich and progressive career, where <laughs> actually you you managed to to convert your passion and interest from childhood into yeah. a very successful career. Obviously, you've you've interacted and 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 worked with many technology leaders across mm -hmm. some of other iconic Canadian organizations, Bell and, yes. and and Research in Motion. When you think about the role of a technology leader CIO today. How would you comment the changes and progressions you may have observed over the last couple of decades, I would assume? And where do you think this role is heading? Like, what are those things that, that you think CIOs will need to be focused on going forward? It's, it's, it's such a great question. And, um, you know, we could talk about this for the entire rest of this uh, <laughs> session. Uh, there's maybe a few things that, that come top of mind uh, for me. I guess first off is that Canada is amazing because of its diversity and inclusion. We're not perfect, 
but um, it affords us a uniqueness uh, on, on a global stage. And I think as CIOs and technology executives and leaders that we should be doing more to harness that inclusion and that diversity. And yeah. so yesterday, as you know, was um, <clears throat> International Women's Day and um, there is an opportunity to be much more inclusive, uh, I'll say that within Canadian Tire in, in tech and more broadly speaking as well. You know, people talk a lot about thinking outside the box, right? Now, um, have you ever thought about what that box is? That box is mm. everything that you've ever learned. Um, all of that <laughs> training, all your assumptions, yeah. all your biases. So how do you think outside of everything that you know? Well, the way you do that is through inclusion and um, diversity and so you know i think um, our leaders of tomorrow those that get that are going to be able to break through and do creative things that we've never been able to do before um, and those that don't get that are going to be doing the same things that everybody else is doing um, i have this definition of collaboration because people often talk about collaboration and, and they, they often confuse it for communication or they confuse it for consensus the way, the way I describe collaboration is that it is the achievement of results impossible to accomplish individually. And so it differentiates from communication where it's just sharing of information. If we don't do something different because people have gotten together, it's not really collaboration. You might be communicating a bunch of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can do something that you couldn't do by ourselves, that's, that to me is, is true collaboration. And um, if all you do is surround yourself with people who are exactly the same as you, your likelihood to break through and do something awesome is hugely diminished. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that that comes to mind um, and, you know, it's important. It's something that we're aggressively doing at Canadian Tire as well, looking to be much more inclusive you know, from a BIPOC, from a gender perspective and, and um, you know, what else can we do? Um, because we know that strengthens us and it represents Canada. And, um, you know, like I said before, we're here to make life in Canada better. I think um, another trend that I see, um, and it's an interesting one, is I, I see a lot of technical leadership being brought over from other countries. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, I question some of that and the purpose and the need for, for that. Um, I do think there's huge value in understanding what's happening around the globe and ideas and, and you know, how retail is done in, Asia, let's say, is very different than what retail looks like in North America. And you should absolutely be learning and, and doing that. Does it mean that you need to hire from other countries just to be able to take advantage of that? I don't, I don't think so. And so I, I have seen that trend happen where a lot of, um, you know, technical leaders are being brought in from other countries and um, to, to try to change how we, we do things. What you don't want to do, in my opinion, is lose what makes you different and to play your own game. And because uh, I've seen that happen with great companies um, where you've seen a influx of, of other countries sort of coming in and saying, well, this is the way to do it. And we lost a little bit of what makes us unique and, yeah. uh, and differentiates us. And so, you know, I see that trend and, and I'd, I'd like to think that we've got great talent. I've met so many smart people uh, across our own country. Um, maybe two other points business acumen, uh, understanding things again, from a customer focus, from a business focus mm -hmm. in terms of, so it's not just all about technology is absolutely critical, right? The uh, ability to deliver something is not really relevant if it adds no value. Um, and so you can get easily down this technical path, but you need to balance that. So you don't, you know, the pendulum doesn't swing too far over where it's just business people who have no technology understanding. It's, it's not, not about the technology, that double yeah, negative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you still need people who get it. They don't have to be experts in everything, but you need to be able to challenge uh, what people are saying and how you think about things. And you just can't outsource all of that. And, and I've seen, uh, it seems to be shifting back towards uh, technology leaders that actually have technical backgrounds or a technical aptitude on things. But for a period of time, it was trending towards you didn't have to be a technologist all you had to do is you know great vendor management and i think people have learned especially during the pandemic that um 
you, if you don't have that depth internally and a, that technical acumen, um, you are at the whim of others and yep. uh, you're leaving a lot up to somebody else to dictate your future. And uh, the ability to question why and how and what's in the best interest of the organization, uh, you don't necessarily want to outsource that. So it's not not about the technology, but you also have that have that business acumen as well. I love that statement that it is not not about technology. Uh, yeah. ac actually, there's yeah. it, it's a very punchy way to describe it. Very very punchy way to describe it. I and in in these interviews that I've done probably 25 of them so far i have had people who you know come from various different backgrounds mm -hmm. ending at the cio level so sure. and i think everybody so far has suggested that this business acumen is critical and the advice was in your career if you presented with the opportunity to go from it into the business area take it Take it, you will be exposed to something new, you'll be better off for it. You'll yes. be stronger as a technology leader. So yes. I think that, that that probably is one of the one of the lessons I've taken is um, don't be just laser focused on progressing within IT. Take opportunity yeah. to go and you know circle circle the wagons around the organization. Sure. That strengthens the, 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 the perspective. Um, you mentioned something important about the strength of our Canadian IT talent. Yes. Uh, I would be curious to get your thoughts on what could we as a community community of of accomplished technology executives what mm. could we be doing better or different to nourish that talent to interject early to actually create the pool of people that will be diverse yes. uh, as the next wave of talent like any yeah. thoughts on that a, a lot of thoughts on that and, and i'll share i'll share with you some of what we're doing at canadian tire even though it, you know you know uh other, or some of our competitors might now you know listen to this and say oh yeah well, we should do that too but i'm going to share it anyways because i think it it strengthens all all canadians um so right now uh technology is a hot hot market yeah. and within technology there are some really really hot areas so cyber security uh, data cloud engineering you know these, these kind of skills um and you know if it's just about money and uh just comp um you know that's one thing but i think there's an opportunity for us to do something a little bit different and that is that realization that people are people they're not machines and we need to think of of people um in their careers they're not you know something to be implemented and decommissioned like a you know piece of technology uh per se and if you think about the individual um as an individual then we as corporations and organizations that are investing in technology talent have an opportunity to build careers and to build long-term capability as opposed to just filling in roles um and it's easier said than done but um, if we do this, then we strengthen the depth of the expertise and, and uh, complement what we're doing through academia uh, into a, a lifelong journey of mm -hmm. learning and uh, uh, continuously progressing in careers. Um, you know, I've been in large organizations and I've seen where individuals are, you know, maybe very knowledgeable in a certain function, uh, but they stagnate. And those functions no longer become relevant over time because of something, something disruptive has happened. Yep. And um, unfortunately, that individual is stuck yep. with a skill set that's not transferable easily. Um, and they're now having to play catch up uh, on things. And so if we shift that a bit um, and we think about the individuals and how do we invest, it strengthens all of us and strengthens the individuals and it, it differentiates you, your company as well. And it's definitely something that um, I'm pushing very aggressively here at Canadian Tire to, to ensure that you know, people who want to come to Canadian Tire, I want to invest in you as a person, in your own personal brand, even if that makes you more marketable to our competitors, um, with the belief that by doing this um, and seeing a company that values you as an individual, that maybe you'll want to stay um, because you know, you've got a career right now, you've got a role right now, but you know, what about the next role and the role after that role? Uh, as well and i'd like to prepare you for that too and so 
it's something I, I believe we can do and we should do. And if, if others do this as well, I think we'll, we'll strengthen um, technology and uh, it, what it can mean to our, our, our organizations and more broadly speaking as well. Yeah. Well, as you said, the objective of Canadian Tire is to make the life of Canadians better. Yeah. What you're doing is making the lives of those you touch and interact with better, helping them, strengthening them. And you're right, if everybody was to do the same, the whole industry would yeah. rise, right? I would, would agree. All be better off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, this is this is wonderful. Excellent. Uh, we often have uh, audience members who are students listening in, mm. who are contemplating a career in technology. Um, any advice for them? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, the first thing I would say is don't worry if you don't have a master plan. Very mm. few people that I know, my peers and other CIOs and CTOs, had some beautiful master plan that they just executed well. Although it feels like it. I mean, I've got two younger daughters, <clears throat> one's in university, one's in high school, but the pressure on people to just have your whole life figured out uh, is, is, is crazy. And, um, you know, the ability to stay unfocused is an ability. It, it's kind of odd to hear that, but if you, you know, think about how if you're driving and you're in a rush and you're trying to get from point A to point B, what you pay attention to is different than if you're a passenger and you're looking around and what you observe and what you notice. And sometimes the opportunities come because you've not been focused. And, but if you're so focused, you miss the opportunities. Um, and I know throughout my career, um, there is risks that were taken. Um, there were people that pulled me. Um, there are things that, um, you know, I, I had no, idea we're going to land into something else and so um not having a master plan being able to not focus too much um can actually be hugely advantageous to you and it gives you the opportunity to see things that others um, may not uh, see i would also advise you and this was an interesting one that i i remember learning was that um, throughout your your career uh, people will give you advice they'll do performance reviews and they'll tell you these are the things you're good at. These are the things you're not good at. And these are the things you need to improve. And, and they'll, they'll tell you things like that. Listen, but uh, take it with a grain of salt. And um, just because you're not strong in something doesn't necessarily mean you need to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, I find people have been more successful when they've doubled down on their strengths. So things that you're really good at uh, saying, I'll be even better at that. And that makes you stand out. Because if all you do is fix the things that people tell you to fix, you become like everybody else. You become average. Yeah. Yeah. You want to stand out, then you know collaborate those areas that you're not great at. Find people who are, and what you are great at, become exceptional. And um, it takes even more work. And uh, you know don't rest on your laurels, but that makes you stand out. And so I would, I would caution uh, people on that. And I would also say, um, don't. Be mindful. I got to be careful here of how I say this, uh, but be mindful of just blindly following rules and best practices. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the definition of best practice is it's what everybody does. And it's, and so if you want to be like everybody else then go follow best practices all day long, if you want to be exceptional, you want your company to be exceptional, then you are going to have to break rules. You have to do things that are not best practice because they have yet to be discovered and you're going to be the one that's going to discover them. Um, and so you, you, if you follow blindly, this is the way to do things, go from A to B, you'll never be able to sort of break out of that. And so um, question. Spoken, spoken, yeah. spoken like a true pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have we have received a number of questions from the audience sure. uh maybe some some that we can we can touch uh yeah. digital like digital transformation of course is a a, yeah. a buzzword these days yeah uh, what does digital transformation mean to you and what does it actually mean in the context of canadian tire um so when i think of digital transformation um I, the way I've explained it in the past is it is the pragmatic application of technology to enhance the customer experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's very broad and there's some key words in there, you know, the focus on customer. So it's not technology for the sake of technology um, and pragmatic application. 
And so, you know, understanding how is this useful versus just a nice to do kind of neat thing. Um, within technology, I have so many solutions looking for problems, tons of them, yeah, uh, there's, yeah. but there's no problem, but it sounds really neat, sounds really interesting. And, and so people want to chase after shiny things. And so being pragmatic, um, understanding deeply, you know, what's at the core to the customer um, is is really important. You know, I go back to the the history of Canadian Tire and the Billis brothers. And so you think, OK, tires. Well, who buys tires? People who have cars. OK, what do people with cars do? They drive places. And so they would give, you know, back in the 20s maps. So pre GPS and uh, mm -hmm. all, all the fun stuff we have these days, but they would give them maps with their tires and it just made so much sense because they were focused on the customer and what they were doing as opposed to, well, I sell tires and I sell this and I, and as a and very product for focus. And so that digital transformation, when you think of the application of the technology in pragmatic ways, um, you can make things better. Um, and so I do believe that anything that can be digital will be. It's a, yeah. and um, it affords you new opportunities, uh, and it also creates disruption. Um, and we'll, um, I mean, it's another great discussion we could have as well. Yeah. Of, you know, is IT dead, um, and what does IT look like in the future? But. <clears throat> Um, that's kind of how I think of digital disruption. That, in, in that's digital. very good. That's very good. So it's really about a customer. It's about being pragmatic. Mm -hmm. It's being not being distracted by shiny objects, but really understanding cool. the core of the of the of the issue and then mapping it to to make the experience better for the clients. Love, lovely. Right. Um, maybe one more question because we are getting getting to the to our time. Uh, anything that like we, we are all experiencing the talent challenges the, the war for talent anything mm. that you can share on like what, what, how are you thinking about that what are the moves you might be making to ensure that you actually have access to the right talent at the right time yeah um so um going to where the talent is as opposed to assuming that people will come to you so you know things like the post and pray methods where you know just because i put a a job posting up doesn't actually mean that the right folks are uh, are going to see um, that posting and and um, you know investing um, prior to the need, mm. which and so developing yeah. the rapport relationships. This could be with institutions, uh, could be through academics, could be through various forums, communities, um, in, industry uh, organizations. Um, and doing that before you have the role is important and because you want to establish that that relationship and start to understand I've I've hired lots of smart people without even having a job understood because they were just smart people and that you know when you hire smart people they figure out the job and where they add value and they can help um, and so you know being out there and you um, uh, making sure that you build the relationships, uh, broadly speaking, you take that at an enterprise level. So it's not just me personally, um, allows you to, uh, to think differently and, um, creating a, a bit of a value proposition. And so if there are folks listening, uh, to this, that are interested in working at Canadian tire you know, things that I shared with you about how we are here to make life in Canada better, that all decisions are made by us. There is no, I don't have to go explain to somebody, you know, why we're different and we have that, that control and that we are going to focus on you as an individual. Um, you know, if that, that appeals to you, then, you know, please, you know, consider Canadian Tire because um, I think we can do some, some great things together. I, I, I love, I love it. I, so it's, it's about relationships and connections. And there was the plug for people there to join go. Canadian there Tire. Love it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, so uh, what a great, what a great way to wrap us up. Now we are at time, one minute actually over time. I want to be very respectful of your time, Rex. This was sure. wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your, uh, your story and, and your perspectives on these really important uh, topics. <laughs>